Welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. A study published this week in Mayo Clinic Proceedings details information about potential cardiac side effects when using off-label drugs to treat COVID-19. With us in studio is Mayo Clinic cardiologist and senior author of the study, Dr. Michael Ackerman. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Ackerman. Thanks a lot. Good to be with you. Dr. Ackerman, good to see you. So uh, tell our audience, first of all, what we mean when we say off-label drugs. Yeah, you know, off-label is the term that's being used for medications that are FDA-approved. You and I can prescribe them, but they've been FDA-approved for different and other specific diseases. So as a cardiologist, I use medications all the time that are FDA-approved, but they're not labeled or indicated for the particular disease that I'm treating right now. And it's because I think it'll work for that disease, and so I'm using it, and that's what's off-label. And so the medications we're hearing about now, like hydroxychloroquine, is off-label for COVID-19. It's on label. For, so people who have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus do take this drug, right? Absolutely. And, and that those would be who, on label. And that's on label or okay. those who are preventing malaria or got malaria and, and are treating their malarial disease. That's the FDA approved indication for a drug like hydroxychloroquine. But for any other purpose, uh, COVID-19 or any other condition, that would be viewed as off-label. So the reason why this is coming to the front is because there is some thought that possibly it would work for COVID patients? Yes, there's, uh, now I'm just a genetic cardiologist. <laughs> um, the infectious disease specialists and scientists are telling us that in vitro, it looks like drugs like hydroxychloroquine might interfere with the ability of the coronavirus to be able to penetrate the cells, the body, the lung cells, or if we got infected and we're having respiratory distress, it may counter or temper or neutralize the inflammatory respiratory distress reaction. And so that's in vitro. The in and vitro meaning in the test tube or in, in the, the test petri tube dish. and yeah. in the dish. Yeah, exactly. And then there's the small study out of, of France that suggested anecdotal benefits. So it's not randomized. It's not controlled. It's not large. But there was a good enough signal that physicians throughout the world are starting to look at a drug like hydroxychloroquine and saying, I think the benefit might outweigh the risk. And while we're waiting for the benefit to be clearly demonstrated by the studies that you and I like to see done for it to have enough evidence for it to become on label and indicated drugs like these are starting to be used all over the world world, particularly in New York, in our country right now. Now you use the word uh, anecdotal and it might and it may and we're curious about, I mean, yeah. so that's the problem here, that's right? The problem. Because um, people are afraid and tell us what's happening. Well, I think uh, the, the what's happening varies all over the place. I mean, I think the signal is quite encouraging. I mean, the the, you talk to infectious disease experts, there's reason for why there's enthusiasm about a drug like hydroxychloroquine with or without the addition of azithromycin or Zithromax, the z right. So there's encouragement and there's hope. There's actually real hope from what I'm told. Again, I just listened to the infectious disease specialists. Uh, but that hope- Yeah, tell us what the concern is from your standpoint. Yeah, the hope is the hope of therapeutic efficacy, which we all hope we'll see, has to be balanced with these are powerful, powerful medications. And like any powerful medication, they don't come without their unwanted side effect baggage. And that unwanted side effect, it's one thing if the side effect is a little headache, a little dizziness, a little diarrhea. It's another thing if that unwanted side effect is drug-induced sudden cardiac death to where the treatment itself becomes the tragic ending for the patient because it caused sudden cardiac death. And that's the, that's the concern that needs to be balanced with the hope for therapeutic efficacy, but what could be the dark side of these medications and can we counter the dark side and can we neutralize that threat? And the good news is we absolutely can. Have you seen this happen where someone died from taking, was it an overdose of hydroxychloroquine or the usual dose? No, usual dose. It can be usual dose, so right dose, but in the wrong host can be a nasty combination. And I think just as recently as a couple days ago, a couple in Arizona 
died from chloroquine. So they took chloroquine as a supplement that they got from, I don't know where, some aquarium uh, <laughs> store. It was chloroquine phosphate, I think right. it was. And yeah, it was chloroquine, which is yeah. sort of the first generation anti-malarial drug and died from what looks to be chloroquine-induced sudden cardiac death. These are powerful medicines, and we need to identify the small group of us who might be QT at risk of this tragic unwanted side effect, and then we can neutralize that threat. Now, so tell us what you mean by QT at risk, and, yeah. and how do you determine that? Yeah, so, so the mechanism behind these drugs unwanted side effect is that they have a tendency to prolong the heart's QT interval. So the heart's QT interval is a surface measurement that we get from a 12 lead electrocardiogram and ECG that tells us what the patient's QTC value is. And that value reflects the health of the heart's electrical recharging system. And just like Goldilocks and the three bears, too hot, too cold, just right, there's a just right range for that QTC value. If it's too hot and gets too long, that person is vulnerable to this unwanted side effect. So we need to have our patients, our doctors, our healthcare team providers, know the QTC, know your patient's QTC so that we know whether they're at incredibly low risk, green light, good to go, or whether there needs to be the caution light or there needs to be the red light stop, this QTC value in this particular host suggests that this risk is a very, very real risk. And then we need to figure out what's our counterattack. So in, in patients like that, you probably would, you would try to avoid hydroxychloroquine as a drug to treat it. Depends, right? So if let's say that COVID-19 patient is my age, young or younger, and the disease is mild, and my QTC is at red alert status, then I probably will skip that therapy because the disease is mild and the risk is outweighing the potential benefit. On the other hand, let's say my COVID-19 is rearing itself badly in me, and now I need the therapeutic benefit if it's there because there's not a lot of other options. I might accept my QTC danger, I might make sure that the doctor and the healthcare team has removed any other QTC aggravating factors, make sure my potassium levels are good, my magnesium levels are good, but it may be worth it, and that's the risk-benefit calculus that the healthcare team will decide as to does the potential benefit outweigh this potential risk of the drug. So it really will be a patient by patient. I mean, it's precision medicine. Mm -hmm. It's deciding what is the best therapy for that patient at that time and, and make sure we're respecting the efficacy if we detect it. and But giving full respect, not fear, but full respect to this unwanted side effect that we can prevent the tragedy of hydroxychloroquine induced sudden cardiac death. But this is a prescription medication. And so people can't just go to their pharmacy and ask for it over the counter. But what they can do is find it in other ways, whether it is from their aquarium or from a relative who maybe would have this prescription. That's why it's important to monitor that. It's really important. Don't take your grandmother's rheumatoid arthritis Plaquenil hydroxychloroquine without guidance from the healthcare team. Before you're placed on these medications, know your QTC. Find out, are you in the QTC danger zone or are you green light good to go? So 90% of all of us, when we get our QTC checked, will be like at the clear in the airport. You are cleared and the risk is gonna be almost zero, 90%. So everybody needs a 12 lead EKG before they take hydroxychloroquine. I think that's the idea. Or let's say they're already in the hospital and they're on telemetry, and you and I can look at the rhythm strip and immediately see by just by eye that if the so-called QT interval is less than half of the RR interval, the heart rate, then we already know that person would be in a QTC green light go status. And then there's even newer ways. So just last Friday, the FDA granted emergency approval for a smartphone enabled ECG device, a mobile device to be used for QTC monitoring for COVID-19 pharmacotherapy. So that 
could be really helpful because now you don't need an ECG technician to go into a COVID positive patient's room before the drug, two hours after the drug, two days later. So we don't have to have them have their exposure risk. We don't have to have them, the ECG technician, using the protective personal equipment. And we might be able to have the QTC being monitored almost like a vital sign. So it could join blood pressure and what's your saturation as a real-time vital sign as to is your QTC still in green light safe status? Has it moved to caution? Let's check things out. Has it moved to red light stop? And that's the algorithm that we've put forward to make it really simple for the healthcare teams throughout the world to get an assessment. Is my patient QT safe for this drug? respecting that it could do a QT reaction, how should we monitor for it? What steps should we take if it's there, the QT signal, and we're now in want, want red light status, <laughs> to counter that? Let's say you and I decide, or the infectious disease docs decide, yes, they really should be on this drug. We're kind of running out of time. We think it will ben be beneficial, or the data is coming out proving its benefit. How, how do we you, counter it? How would you best describe the situation right now as people search for medications or combinations of medications that will help uh, patients with COVID-19? Yeah, I think like all of us, no matter where we are in our feelings and sense about coronavirus, it ranges from, I would say, still ignorance and sort of an oblivious nature. What's the big deal? to beyond paranoid fear that's really out of control. And I think knowledge allows order to be restored. Proof allows a calm to occur, right? So I think as we get more knowledgeable, we know we need to be physically distanced from each other. That's incredibly important. I don't know how many times I've washed my hands today, a lot. <laughs> my temperature this morning was 96.9. So I I've, I've got the green light go in those parameters. But I think the healthcare teams are also, like the community at large, it's wild west out there. We have uh, healthcare teams who are sort of saying, I'm going to use these drugs, and I'm not going to even bother checking the patient's QTC. We'll just view that consequence, drug-induced sudden cardiac death, as friendly fire in this war. We have others who will say, let's send the ECG tech in there before, two hours after, the next day, the next day, the next day, exposing them and using up mass and having sort of QTC paranoia itself. And I think we, we, we can provide the urgent guidance. That's what we've done here now at Mayo Clinic is that we, we have to step in if this drug is going to work and if it's going to be used more, it's being used a lot already, we need to make sure that it's safely used and that we decrease the chances of drug-induced tragedy where the treatment caused the sudden cardiac death to the greatest extent possible. And we can, we absolutely can. Used wisely, this drug can be used very well. All right, so the drugs that you're concerned about are chloroquine, yeah. hydroxychloroquine, and isn't there a drug to treat HIV that also can have the same side effect, that is arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death? Absolutely, all three of those, plus azithromycin. So some people are using hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin in combination, and both of those drugs by themselves independently interfere with the heart's electrical recharging system. Both drugs can cause the QT to prolong. And so that could be a double whammy. So if you got the QTC alert and you're placed in a red light status, be very, very careful. You and I probably are going to say, let's just do hydroxychloroquine. Let's not do both of these up front because both of these might start to become the perfect storm and, and cause a bad consequence for our patient. So bottom line, there are some potential harmful side effects when we're using off-label drugs to treat the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. And those drugs, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and an HIV drug, you... Give me the name. Yeah, uh, it is... Lopinavir? Latinavir. Latinavir. 
Yep. And Lopinavir and, and ritinavir. Okay, those two also, and yeah. they're being used. And they're being used. All right, and all of those drugs carry the risk of cardiac arrhythmia and even sudden cardiac death. Yes, but most of us can take these drugs safely. Most, 90% of us will be QT cleared. But it's, it's the five to ten percent get... that we have to be as concerned about saving their lives, and not view if this just happens oh once in a while, that we do drug induced sudden death as friendly fire. Not acceptable. We can try to save everybody's life from COVID nineteen, whether by the disease itself, or by our well intended treatments of COVID-19. But it's important to figure out who those people are at high risk. Absolutely, and we can figure that out. All right, our thanks to Mayo Clinic genetic cardiologist, Dr. Michael Ackerman, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me.